Lynch. She released her fourth CD, Break the Crystal Frame, with Pub uh, Willow Publishing Australia, and is currently working on her next book and, and CD. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr Maeve Heaney. She will speak tonight on women's leadership in the future of the church, naming the nameless. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful um, um, to the musicians that are collaborating with me. Uh, this is a talk that is weaved through with music, and without Macaulay and Canberra's own Stephen and Sean, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that, so I'm grateful to them for their presence here. When I worked in England, I was invited by the Anglican Church to preach at Evensong at Winchester Cathedral. They have one of those old pulpits built around a pillar. The ritual for the preacher goes as follows. One of their acolytes comes to where the preacher is sitting. You get up, you follow said acolyte, who opens the gate, ushers you in, and proceeds to lock the gate until such time as the sermon is finished, after which one is released. I won't say this feels the same. Exactly. No one does tradition like the English, so I'm not even sure what the originating reason actually was, whether to protect the preacher from the people or vice versa. But it says something about the power of and the danger of words. And it came to my mind as I prepared to speak on a theme that is not only close to my heart, but essential to my life and work as missionary, theologian and woman, although not necessarily in that order. Women's leadership in the future of the church, naming the nameless. And there are three themes in that title. The future of the church, what women have to do with it in terms of leadership. And naming the nameless, or what I would like to call an exercise in imagination. And if I could start for a moment with the last, and in a talk entitled the Thomas More Forum, it is appropriate to do so. Amongst his many talents, St. Thomas More has one that is often less noticed. His understanding of the need to imagine or reimagine things differently. That classic book called Utopia is an exercise in imagination. Utopia, which means, or rather implies, both the good place and no place at the same time, is not simply an attempt to describe the perfect society as we might imagine. To quote the latest introduction, the book is not supposed to give the reader a view of a perfect society or analyze what is good or bad about utopia. Rather, the work encourages taking a new view of social and political problems by seeing the alleged and strange solutions to them and challenges readers to try and find out what they approve or disapprove of. And why? Utopia tries to provoke the imagination of its readers. This is one of the reasons why I use music in my theological endeavors. Not just as a pastime or to make the medicine of solid thought more accessible, which it may do, but because the arts and music are ways in which we make sense of things, faith seeking understanding because symbols precede uh, concepts. Because tell me who writes a nation songs, and I don't care who writes her laws, to allegedly quote Plato, or more importantly perhaps, my people perish for lack of vision, to quote scripture. Through music I try and gain access to scripture, or a faith experience, or a doctrine, and open it so that we can feel, or think, or understand it afresh. I'm not alone in this quest. There are many people across our world trying to do this in what we call the fields of theological aesthetics or theopoetics and others. But neither is it a new idea. We think of imagination as something less real than fact, but that's not true. Imagination allows us to see the possible, to see the impossible, and to make it happen. Another great English man of faith, blessed John Henry Newman, in his masterwork, The Grammar of Ascent, differentiated between what he called notional ascent, by which he meant theoretical, important, but of the mind, 
and real assent, which he used to refer to what our heart and values adhere to. But in his original manuscript, when he, wrote about, when he spoke about real assent, real and imaginative were used as synonyms. What we cannot image, what we can't imagine, will rarely happen. <clears throat> However, there's another reason why we need imagination, to name that which is not named or known. And it has to do with theme one of our title, the future of the church. What will the church like look like in the years to come? Do you know? We don't know, even know what the world is going to look like in the future. The church we are traditioning into the future because that is what Christians do when they live out their faith. We remember the past, we live it in the present in order to build for the future. This church that we are traditioning forward is changing shape. Ghislaine Lafon, a Benedictine monk who taught at the Gregorian in a book called Imagining the Catholic Church, wrote, I'm not sure that a theologian can today risk saying a valid word for all humanity or even only for one's own church if he or she have not first accepted seeing their own universe shake. It is true that the church has words of eternal life, but not every form of church. Only if today we don't cover our faces to the fact that the tide that is carrying away Western civilization is taking the church with it, will we be able to imagine other forms which in their turn can allow the church to survive and to contribute to the birth of another world. Lafon captures what is at stake, so clearly illustrated by Australian poet Lisa Jacobson in a poem called There Are Stones That Sing. The churches are almost empty or sold, as if they've reached their tipping point and from the pulpits God slid out. And all that fanciful gold leaf on heaven's floor was incinerated by our telescopes. And bits of tattered God fell down. It's a sad vision, but I do not quote it in a pessimistic spirit. I have deep faith that the Holy Spirit accompanies the church and its future will unfold in God's providence. But it is a changing church. I form people for roles and ministries that are changing. I try and teach the seminarians I work with to be people of discernment, able to distinguish what is essential and what might well need to change. We need to be people of imagination. And today we're imagining the role of women in the church. One of the questions I was asked in an interview about today was expressed in these terms. Are you going to talk about and celebrate what women are doing in the church or, or about what they should be allowed to do and are not? The answer, I'm afraid, is both and. With St. Thomas More, I think the Catholic stance often is both and. All the beauty we see and have, as well as the call to more. Some scholars reject scripture and Christianity with them because of the way women are depicted or their absence. They think that the very maleness of God represented therein and transmitted through centuries of preaching and teaching excludes them from belonging to something that has institutionalized and legitimized the subordination and often oppression of women. That is not my position. In fact, when I read carefully and against the backdrop of the culture within which the New Testament books were written, Christianity is revolutionary. Jesus chooses women as disciples and apostles. He taught women as he taught men. He praised their faith. He allowed them to challenge and broaden his vision and ministry. 
He defended them against arbitrary divorce and appeared to them first, entrusting them with the preaching of the gospel to the apostles. The first Christian community never questioned the baptism of women, although it had no Jewish precedent. To quote the wonderful 20th century writer Rosemary Houghton, those communities were ahead of their times. And I quote, women in the early church had a new sense of themselves, and the men had this sense about the women. So they took on new status and roles very quickly, but this did not last. It was one of those breakthroughs that come too soon and cannot be assimilated into the rest of life. But the power of love finds ways to break through. And too little is known and read about the presence of women in the church in influential roles during its 20 centuries of life and ongoing. So I would like to start by celebrating that, celebrating the women in our lives, in this room, in our past, who have marked us. So I invite you to think of them, the ones who have taught you, Witness to a loving God, pushed you to think further, opened doors for you, taught you how to pray as we sing. Come, teach me to believe in the darkness, woman of faith. Teach me how to see the way to go, woman of Teach me how to love in the pain, woman of love. Knowing his love always remains ever the same, and may his will be done, woman of
There are legions of women, past and present, who have worked in and for the church and to whom we are indebted. But there are also many gaps and there are movements to bridge them. In his 2013 apostolic exhortation on the proclamation of the gospel in today's world, Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis called for a more incisive female presence in the church. He asked theologians and pastors to reflect upon how power is understood and lived out in the Catholic Church, so as to recognize more fully what this entails with regard to the possible role of women in decision making in different areas of the church's life. In 2014, the invitation was taken up by an organization called INSECT, an acronym you won't forget, which stands for the International Network of Societies for Catholic Theology. This organization gathers the leaders of every major official Catholic theology society in the world. It's the UN of Catholic Theology. <clears throat> and they gather around a research topic of choice for three years. In 2014 to 2017, that topic was the one we address today. I have rarely sat in a room with people of such diversity and so much convergence of vision. This is a universal issue. Some of their insights included, and I'm only going to name them briefly, a sense of tiredness. This is not a new theme, so we need to try and gather all around the table again and see what went wrong. The problem of ecclesial culture and the gap between the official statements and policies and the actual practice of structural accountability. The question of authority and power in the church, the need for robust theological reflection on baptism and broadening the base of ecclesial governance. The lack of theological literacy in contemporary clerics, especially in the episcopate, this is a universal statement. We don't need to think Australia. <laughs> the need for a holistic theological anthropology that factors in all gender issues, including the effects of colonization. The history and gifts of women religious to the church, which have been both prophetic and problematic at times. And one of the most interesting that emerged for me was this one. A call for a theological reflection on the sin of fear, personal, institutional, and cultural, as one of the main underlying obstacles to changing the church's structures in relation to the inclusion of women. In particular, the fear of losing power, of challenging power. We can't let them do X, or they'll want Y, or not. But in any case, fear is a bad advisor. I'll come back to this. More locally, at the intersection of church and state, in 2017, the recommendations of the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to, sexual, to Child Sexual Abuse asked for more participation of laymen and women in governance, management, and consultative structures. This was unproblematically accepted by the bishops with the creation of an implementation advisory group which has started work now. However, this acceptance shouldn't surprise us, and I take my hat off to ways in which the Australian church often leads the way. Going backwards in time, I recently reread the Australian Catholic Bishop Conference's social justice statement for the year 2000. How many here have read it? May I have a show of hands? Mm -hmm. An official response, um, for those who aren't looking, it's about a fifth of those of us in the room. Just to... An official response to, the three, to a three-year research project called Woman and Man in Christ, which many in this room know more about than I do. Thank you, Andrea. This is one of the clearest statements I have ever read on the ways forward to ensure the role of women in leadership in the Catholic Church is discerned and implemented. It is an exceptional document. Its decisions include to commit to better balance of men and women on ecclesial councils, organizations, and advisory boards, 
to provide employment programmes to develop and protect equality and dignity of women. To foster research into the participation of women looking at scriptures, history, liturgy, canon law. To provide guidelines for inclusive language and the possibility of lay preaching in liturgy. And there is no better time than now when the authority over liturgical language has been devolved to the National Episcopal Conferences. To provide policies of care for pain in specific areas of church teaching and life that some find more difficult, such as divorce, ordination, sexuality. To engage in dialogue with indigenous women and to create a commission of Australian Catholic women and a supporting office, as well as educational opportunities for the implementation of the above. The document is exceptional. It's only seven pages long. I invite you to read it, and it is an official statement of the bishops of your local church. So it is a cause for pride, and perhaps also for an examination of conscience. Where are we? This was the year 2000. When we set up the Xavier Centre for Theological Formation, ACU, the Faculty of Theology, implemented a nationwide consultation process on needs and concerns to identify the gaps rather than we reinvent the wheel. The largest group of individual responses we received were from lay, mainly female pastoral associates, speaking of their concerns and the difficulty of their work in and for the church. Many of them had good theological formation that was somehow not being put to use as they thought it would have been. So an examination of conscience is perhaps necessary. But that being the case, what is the way forward? How can we move forward? I'd like to suggest a few ways. One, as a people of God, we need to journey together. And I'd really like to emphasize this. We need to listen to one another. We need to listen to the voices we don't like and ask why they think that way. What is underlying? We see this clearly in Twitter spaces. It is not only our politicians who have shifted from sensible, balanced discussion of ideas to name-calling and polarized oppositions. The Catholic web world is full of opinions we should struggle to reconcile with the reality of faith we profess that before, or even as I disagree with you, you and I are one in Christ, bonded more deeply and more eternally than the members of flesh and blood. We belong to one another in Christ. Could I give you a theological example? Two theologians with very different uh, positions on the role of women in the church agree on one thing, the importance of God having incarnated as a man. That is to say, the maleness of Jesus. Now, before I present their opinions, I would like to just say by way of preamble that for me, this is not an issue. I like Jesus as he is. I consecrated my life to him. But secondly, it would be heretical to say, and I speak as a theologian, it would be heretical to say that because the Son of God is male in his incarnation, that means the Logos of God, second person of the Trinity, was male before the incarnation. St. Ambrose, fourth century, was very clear on that because it would bring a human limitation, gender, into the uncreated God. However, to make my point, it was important for God to incarnate as a man. Why? Sandra Schneider speaks of how the values God wanted to introduce us to, humility, service, preference for the poor and the underdog, in fact, the very revelation of God's face would not have been clear at that time if God had come as a woman who was expected to live that way. Fair point, one thinks. Although she can be provocative, Jesus accepted membership in the oppressor class of society in order from within to demonstrate the bankruptcy of the dominative social system. Manfred Hawke, the theologian on the other side, quotes Louis Boyer to name the divine wisdom of God in becoming a man in similarly provocative terms. At the risk of provoking storms of righteous indignation, I shall state quite frankly, it would have been monstrous if the Son of God had appeared as a woman. <laughs> they actually agree on, on the point in question. But what is underlying their positions? What's at stake? 
What can we learn from one another? There are no linear advances in thought and life practice. We dialogue, we agree, we disagree, we change opinions. To live is to change, to be perfect is to have changed often. Blessed John Henry Newman. So we need to journey together. Second, we need a greater knowledge of scripture. What is there, what it could mean, and a critical awareness of what might be hidden in plain sight. And I'm going to come back to this at the end. Third, greater knowledge of the history of our church and the roles women have had in the past. There have been foundresses who governed city, women rulers who called for organized and convened church synods and councils, including the very council that clarified the doctrine of Jesus' human and divine natures. Abbesses who chose bishops, lay and religious women who preached to clergy, bishops, the College of Cardinals and a Pope. Women who were called deaconesses, even if we are still unclear about what that meant. And that's okay. Because together with great knowledge of what has happened, we need a better understanding of how church tradition works. Catholics have two main sources of revelation, scriptures and tradition. There's also reason, human experience and others, but these are our two main sources, which means we cannot find everything we believe in in scripture or in the past, the sacraments, the structure of the church, some of our moral teachings have developed over time when as church we read the signs of the times guided by the spirit through an attentive listening to the sense of the people of God, sensus fidelium, from the bishops through to the last baptized, Lumen Gentium 12. Together and each according to our roles we can discern ways forward. This is not a call for change as much as a call to honour the truth we are entrusted with. To neither race ahead of truth nor lag behind it. We need further theological reflection on a Catholic ecclesiology, our understanding of the church and how the theology of baptism and priesthood interweave and support one another. Vatican II gave us a wonderful ecclesiology. And the name that I prefer is the one Richard Gallardi uh, speaks of when he speaks of structured communion, founded on baptism. We are baptized into the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. This ecclesiology includes a sound sacramental understanding of leadership. But more research is needed into a theology of ministries that could include, validate, and enable us all to share our charisms. In what fields and tasks could bishops delegate more? How do our gifts of participating in the one priesthood of Christ lead us to support the priests we often ask too much of? And how do we understand power anyway in Christian and theological terms, which is perhaps the most important question of all? Vatican II did not and perhaps could not answer those questions. We need to do it. We also need, and I only have two more, a greater knowledge of canon law, for what is possible and not possible. Until the year 1917, you didn't have to be a cleric to be a cardinal. You only needed to have what was called minor orders, which means it is a church, not a divine law. And it could change back or broaden. Cardinals elect the popes. There are spaces in canon law for lay preaching and precedence. We could think about how to facilitate that. As a woman who belongs to an order uh, that it has been pontifically approved with a charism to preach the word of God, I must say I feel this one strongly. The people of God have the right to hear God spoken in female. And there are ways in which it could be done. The last point, we need to move from fear to prayerful imagination. Fear is not a good advisor. Let's imagine together where we're going to go. And in order to try and do that, on your sheets, you, on your tables, you have some sheets, which some of you I saw looking at. They have two sides. On one, you will find a well-known reading of the Samaritan woman. We've read it most, we read it most years during Lent. 
At face value, this reading, and face value is important because scripture is for us revelatory text, so we read it as we find it. It is a beautiful reading of Jesus, tired at the well, meeting and talking to a woman alone of a rival nation about faith, her life, and religion. After which she goes to the Samaritan town and is instrumental in bringing the town to Jesus. May I just share that this is the reading that first brought me to an experience of prayer. Through the words, if only you knew, Maeve, who you're talking to, you would ask him and he would give you living water. You will have heard many interpretations of this text, including that she must have been a woman of bad reputation to have come to the well so early, although the text does not say that. After all, she had five husbands today. And that her word didn't really bring them to Christ. That happened afterwards when they came to see him. According to some biblical scholars, this is one of the readings that is textbook of what they call trivialization of women, in which there is a woman in a biblical text uh, who is not read to the fullness of what is there. And there are many. So I'd like to suggest a different interpretation. I'd like to invite you through song to another interpretation based on the critical analysis of a, uh, analysis of a variety of biblicists. Some Jahanine scholars suggest as follows. The text is not meant to be read literally for various reasons. One, it's not clear that Jesus did pass through Samaria and that this event happened. Two, the woman's not named, which means she could be a type figure, a symbol figure. Three, it's really unlikely that a woman of that time was married five times. Four, the underlying symbolism of betrothal at a well is an image that repeats itself in the story of Israel. So again, it's a type story about betrothal between God and his people, or God's people. And when you read it, the text presents a highly religious and theological discussion about Jesus' identity and the place of Samaria in the history of salvation. It's a really theological text and discussion. And the five husbands have a symbolic correlation in five moments of infidelity of Samaria to the covenant. To the covenant. Therefore, if we try and venture into the minds of those who wrote the text and their contemporaries, it is probably a recognizable story about the history of the Christian community in Samaria and the role of the women therein. That is to say, the people writing scripture and living in the community of Samaria tell the story so that we can understand what was happening at that time. Now, that's an interpretation gathered from various biblical scholars that you can take or leave. What you can't take or leave is that in the Gospel of John, in this text, the first place where Jesus names himself as the I am is found. And Jesus reveals it to this woman in a dialogue of mutual discovery. I invite you to reimagine with me what that might mean. I am, you are, nameless, claimless, still. Through this small token, called you to honor and overdue. 
covenant One of those conversations that mock a world One of those rare occasions where time stands still And the truth that was claimed as those two worlds collide and change shape She's more than a match for your mind She can find her way through all the clues to your truth and your power For now is the hour of Let me just finish by returning to the start. And could I say what I need to say in story form? I'm not a feminist theologian. That was not my training. Nor is it why I'm in the church and work to train its future leaders, women and men. I am in the church because one day, while on the top floor of a double-decker bus in my hometown of Bray, while passing a church, I blessed myself. And I asked myself, why? It led me on a journey that brought me to have an experience of prayer and of love that became the ground of my existence. And I want every woman and man in the world to have the possibility of that life that the church offers. And from what I can tell of the women I work with and the women of the future, my nieces, the longer we postpone a greater involvement of women in leadership positions in the church, the less people will come to know the life of Christ. We're simply not convincing. Our structures are poorer for the lack of women's voices and richer when they are heard. So women in leadership roles is not an issue of a st certain strand of theology in which I was not trained. It is all of our problem because more and more young men and women will not even approach if we cannot get our heads and hearts, lives and structures around this. Thank you. Okay, the first question we have is from Patrick Jones, retired college teacher at McKillop, Durham Island and Grammar. On the great medieval theme of authority, we must remember that at the crucifixion, the men went into hiding and the women remained. And at the resurrection, the men were still in hiding when the women arrived on the scene. Women are the two great fundamentals of Christianity. What authority does this extend to women today? Thank you, um, great question. Um, and I think two things. Um, I, I do think, I mean, it is obvious to me that Christianity is, and that Christ Jesus, that our faith has all the potential to be pro-women, pro-humanity. We are all made in the image and likeness of God. And tradition is important. So regathering and remembering how those women were and who they were is really important. I read a really interesting um, 
uh, and actually it's the, it's, it's the same author I quoted before, Rosemary Houghton. She has a beautiful reading of what happened uh, in the first centuries of the church, and it goes in, in line with what I was saying. Um, the women that knew Christ and that emerged, something new happened and they were aware of that, and they were all aware of that. Mm? But sometimes when, when grace pushes in, uh, there's a pushback that's just as strong. It's a little bit like Jesus was guided by the Spirit to go into the desert. So as soon as he starts to move in spirit, he gets temptations. So if I were uh, the enemy, um, I would tempt those who are being moved in the spirit, not those who aren't. Does that make sense? So if there's a movement forward, there can be a pushback. So, so she, ex she explains what happened in the first centuries and even then the pushback afterwards in the early centuries of the church uh, to women in leadership roles, however that was conceived. I'm not stating exactly what that was, but there was a liberation there, there's no doubt. Um, because something new was happening. So the fact that it's foundational is really important and, and, and there, there are the founding years of Christianity that will always be referential, but our faith does not only depend on the past. Tradition is about gathering, it's not just history, it's not whatever happened is okay and whatever didn't happen can't happen. Our faith is a growing faith, that's part of it. Even, even scripture, scripture was born of, of the Christian communities, it wasn't the other way around. So it is the Christian community that gave us scripture. It's the community that advanced, that has given us the church. And a lot of what we believe and what we live has been born of that beautiful discerned accompany of the spirit, accompaniment of the spirit. So we need to trust in that process and think through it. Does that make sense? So it's both and. It's beautiful that it's there, we hold it, but we don't just look back, we look forward with God and we journey together. Um. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from Marilyn Hatton, from uh, one of our parishioners, a member of Concerned Catholics. What do you think is the greatest barrier to our prayerful imagining? Mm, that's a great question. Ooh. Can I, I'd name two. One is um, our fear. I really do think we, we are hijacked by fear of what's not, not in ourselves of what's not, possi not, what's not possible. And um, in our churches, I see, I see a lot of fear, which is born perhaps of distrust or of lack of knowledge of one another and lack of dialoguing. Um, and, and perhaps as well, lack of witness. You know, sometimes you need to see something as possible before you think that it can be possible. So, so witness to people working and living in freedom that could call us forward. Um, mm. But that's a, that I think each one of us would need to pray that. <laughs> that those are two, fear, I think fear holds us, I really do. And by fear I mean my own fear of what I might be asked, um, my fear of what others might do if I give them a bit, of, a bit of space. So if I actually let go of the power that I have, what will happen? And I don't just say that, uh, that's a human condition. I don't just say that uh, to the men in the room about letting women in. I mean, women, we can be just as controlling in other ways. You know, when I have a little bit of authority, well, what'll happen if I, if I let somebody else have it? Well, maybe you'll just find you enjoy yourself more. <laughs> you know that you're freer and, 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 and you don't have so much responsibility or we get further quicker. So, so that's what I mean by fear. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tracy from Sydney asks, you closed your address by saying you are not coming from a feminist theological perspective. Mm. Why should this matter? Great question. Um, simply because, um, one, I, I genuinely simply was not trained in, in feminist theology. There are method, methods that are liberation theologies, feminist theologies. That wasn't my training. My area of expertise is theological aesthetics, so I've delved into semiotics. and So it's not my area of theological expertise, so just to be honest. Um, and I think behind that there is, I think here definitely I intuit, but across the world I think there has been, like any new area of thought, there has been, the, the progress hasn't been linear, so there have been good and not so good experiences of feminist theology, which I think is normal. Like anything that starts uh, uh, will develop in a way and that there are many types of feminist theology and womanist theology and black. So, so that's it. there's a beautiful variety there. But I guess um, I feel the need to say, when I think we're talking about women's issues, 
and it instantly gets linked with a certain methodology, I feel we miss the point, this is a mainstream issue. This is not just, and, and there are other issues, and perhaps one of the reasons I didn't feel drawn, I mean, I was born into, born into faith in a community that uh, is dedicated to preaching, and the first, we have three branches, women, married couples, and men, because that's the order they were born in, and the women's branch was formed for women to preach. So it was, in one sense, you could call that feminist uh, or a pro-women. Uh, it, was, it was born out of a conviction that all baptized are called to preach in one shape or form. Uh, um, so I'm not saying that there's no intentionality there, but I think as soon as um, I can remember looking at it and thinking, well, that's one area, but there are lots of areas of need. And I fear sometimes when we only situate it there because it looks like, well, then they'll take care of that. And I think it's too big and too important. It's a mainstream issue. It's for men and women. In, in Brisbane, we're doing some activities around this, and we are very careful to say this is for men and women to talk about this. And maybe in two years' time, we'll have shifted and we'll be looking at something else that is, that is uh, linked to it, and it develops further. But it's not just for a few, and it's definitely not just a problem for women. It's, it's a church issue. Uh, thank you. Chris Evans, uh, one of our parishioners and a primary school teacher, asks, in what fields could bishops and priests delegate more? Ooh, I think in lots. It depends how you understand consult, doesn't it? You see, w w when I said that I think we need to think more about the theology of priesthood, um, what I'm trying to say is Vatican II gave us an ecclesiology, ecclesiology of people of God, of communion. There are lots of images there. Um, and it placed baptism at the heart. Now, one of the parts of that, our theology of priesthood right now has, has the authority of prophet, priest, and king situated and very linked to the theology of priesthood, which is fine to a certain degree. Um, but how do you hold that together with the accountability, the transparency, the consultancy, the listening to the census fidelium? So I think we need to build structures for our church that enables the collaboration between the baptized and the priesthood in a way that shares it. So in that sense, we are all prophet, priest, and king. So there are many ways in which preaching, teaching can and is shared. There are ways in which the governance of a parish, of a parish can and is shared with others. Now, I'm not saying that that means we become a democracy because I don't think that's the way it works. Um, and I think the responsibility ends with someone and we believe in an ordered communion. I do believe in an ordered communion. I believe there have to be responsibilities and there has to be training for responsibility that priesthood is an ecclesial vocation and therefore it's not just anyone who puts up their hand, I, I want to take charge, it's an ecclesial, we all discern it. One of the most moving moments in an ordination is, has, is he worthy? And they're supposed to have checked with the people of God that he's worthy, like this, but that's what the process is about. What I'm saying is it's, it's a shared, so, in governance, a lot can be shared. Um, in, in, in sacraments, in our worship, there are ministries. So for example, the ministries, the, the ministries that we have on the journey, there are, what, there's ministries of extraordinary um, um, ministries for communion, but even the ministries of, um, on the journey to priesthood, uh, acolyte, lector, that is now framed that way, arguably, in other moments, they could be ministries that could be a bit broader. I'm not a liturgical theologian, but that's, that's a recent, that was Paul VI, the 20th century, and I'm not sure it's the best way for priests to prepare, to be honest. I'm not, I think they need to read and, and be acolytes. I'm looking at the priests in front of me. <laughs> Don't give me. I think the training has to be there, but I think we could perhaps think of ministries around reading and around differently, and that isn't to do with challenging anything that is changing the nature of our structured communion. It's simply actually recognizing what often happens uh, in our churches. Um, so again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to present decisions. I'm saying there are areas in those three that we already are collaborating in and we could name and develop much further and ritualize and commission and celebrate and, 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 and um, develop. Thank you. Cheryl Jones from Yes, who is at St. John Paul II College. How do you separate your lack of subscription to feminist theology and the special place of women in the church of which you speak so liberally? Why are they disconnected? And I think this last question is the same as the other one. My only point in saying um, that I'm not a feminist theologian is I'm not that specifically trained. I am committed to women and men and uh, uh, living 
to the fullness of their uh, uh, personhood in Christ and all that that implies. And right now for the past, and I guess this is it, for the past two years, because of roles that I have been asked to take on, I find myself constantly being asked to speak about being a woman in the church because I am in a position of leadership and responsibility in, in, in different ways, in theological formation. And so I'm negotiating what that feels like. Uh, but I was drawn into this. I don't have a problem with it, especially because it is asked of me. Um, uh, and because I think it's all of our, it's all of our, even those who dedicate to other things, it's all of our issues. Okay, um, okay we have two, uh, three more questions. Uh, Sister Claire Condon. Thomas Aquinas stated that women are misbegotten males in church theology. What change have we? What chance have what we? Chance have we? <laughs> yes, I'm changing things. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Aquinas, what did you do? Like, what can you say? Such a brilliant mind and so stupid at times, it goes to show. I'm sorry, contextualize it all you want, but that was, that, that was, um, huh? Yeah. Yes, 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 absolutely also. But, but you have to, like, and when you read the fathers of the church, this is why I go back to the sin thing. Like, in, gen in general, those fathers were gentle, humble, loving men, and yet when they start to talk about women, <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's scary reading. So I, I do feel that there's a real push and pull there of a breakthrough that, that, that uh, was before its time. Uh, so there is no excuse, and I'm sure he cringes. I hope he bloody cringes. <laughs> Excuse my <laughs> Irish. Okay, we have two final uh, questions. Uh, Shannon asked, in what ways can we encourage young girls uh, uh, to be involved in church leadership roles? Mm. Well, I think first we need to witness it. Uh, I think they need to see women and be drawn. Women who walk tall. I love that image of the incurved woman. And let me just share, say, like, I'm religious. So part of this, and this might have something to do with the conversation before, I love my community. I love it. It gave me a beautiful spirituality. It gave me an amazing charism. But they didn't really teach me to obey well. I feel the first 10 years of my life, <laughs> and to obey well as in they taught me to obey too much, if that makes sense. Like, like the, the beginning, about 10 years into missionary life, I began to pray into the incurved woman and think, straighten that spine, woman. Straighten. You can love Jesus, love the church, and say what you think. Uh, straighten the spine uh, and be who you're called to be. So I think, one, it's witness. And, and, and two, I think, I think Jesus has to come first. Like, people will come to the church because of Jesus, because of how we love one another before anything. And, and within that, let's be communities of, of, of equals and that respect one another. And when they see that, they want to be part of it. When they see how we treat one another, um, men and women, and how we love one another, that's attractive. Okay, the final question is from Clara from Ebbett. Uh, there is often a focus on a struggle for power which involves only a small portion of the church. The real focus seems to be the lack of formation of the laity, male and female, to enable them to live out their baptismal vocation and fill the many vacuums in church leadership. Would you uh, comment on that view, please? Okay, yes and no would be my view. I think there is a lot of need for theological formation and this is one of the reasons we set up a centre. I also think there are some lay people who are very well formed theologically, just want to say. Um, so, so yes and no because I think, I, I think we need to think about power. So when I hear people who are in positions of power say, oh well, it's just a struggle for power, I kind of think, well yeah, but if you have it, <laughs> it's easy to say that this is a struggle for power. So, so we can't be naive. Often underneath the surface of things, it's about power. Can I give you an example? And this came up in a class the other day with, with seminarians. We were talking about um, styles of liturgy and, and ones they like. And there was a small group, so, and, and we have diverse. And they're lovely. They read, they're a lovely, brave bunch of young men who are trying to discern their calling. But, so we had this talk, and some of them prefer kind of more, more kind of classic or more conservative or some of the, or the music of kind of... Um, and so we, we broke open the conversation and they were kind of saying, oh, well, we like this. And I, said, I, and I said, what if the issue, like, have you thought about how that liturgy makes people feel? Makes, makes lay people feel, makes women feel? Have you thought about the power issues underlying 
that, not because they're conscious, but what it reflects and how it makes people feel about where the shared space is in the room. So often, the implicit issue in some of our discussions are about where power lies. So I don't think, and I do think we need to renew what power means, and, and we believe in a gospel in which God let go of all power. So how, how, how do you unpack that? Kenosis, empty yourself. Uh, but what we can't do is pretend it's not there, and it's not an, an issue we need to name. You know, in the same way as I, I worked in England with, with um, Africans for years, and it took them four years to, to speak about the difficulty of having a white woman lead there. And we were friends, do you know what I mean? But I'm a white woman, Irish, educated white woman. Um, so, so we need to name the power struggles so that we can deal with them. Thank you, uh, Dr. Maid Heaney. Please thank her. Thank you. Thank you.